Welcome to the Good Quality Podcast presented by Swish Cultures with your host, Ashton Smith Gooden, shining light onto women in sports and entertainment. On this week's episode, we have the Coffee Sisters, Sydney and Nia, sharing their journeys of growing up in a basketball household and what it's like playing professionally. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe. Now let's get to the show. Definitely want to start off with your guys' journey at Hopkins and kind of going from there. So how was your experience at Hopkins? Um... Our experience at Hopkins, I think, was very different from a lot of uh, kids that play high school basketball, just because Hopkins in Minnesota is known as a powerhouse for the girls and boys. I know when I was there, I won two state championships. I think, Nia, you won three, right? Um, Yeah, so, I mean, we played for Coach Cause, which he's an amazing coach during the time. we thought he was really hard on us and practices were super duper intense. Um, but now that I've been through college, I know why. As soon as I got to college, my first practice was a breeze. Like everything we did in college, we were doing in high school. Um, so he prepared us really well for that. So anyone who comes out of um, Hopkins High School is like super prepared once they get to college. Um, so I think that's the main thing that I loved about Hopkins is just how much they prepare you for the next level. No, that's so. I would say the same thing. So um, I pretty much grew up playing with like all my good friends. So it it was just a good time. And then playing with Sydney and, you know, some of the greats of Hopkins, like it was always a strong team. And they really instilled in us at a young age, like just – the work ethic that you need to have to be at Hopkins um, from like breakfast club from 7 a.m. during the summer, like all summer, I think, like fall ball, summer ball camps. And once you got to see them, like it was, you know, it was go time. So they constantly instilled, you know, hard work. Like you don't really have a choice. If you're going to be at Hopkins and you want to play, you have to work hard. So just, you know, being a part of that program, it prepared me. I told Coach Cods from the beginning, shout, shout out to him because he just retired after 21 years. But I got to Northwestern in my first practice. Like I, I dominated and I was ready, I was prepared. So um, as uncomfortable as it was, as hard as it was, I mean, looking back at it, I'm so happy that I got two state championships with Sydney and I got three overall and I got to play with my best friends and for one of the best programs in Minnesota. So it was amazing. No, that sounds fire. And you guys keep mentioning how you guys played with each other. How was that dynamic? Because I see the behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it's like um, to have family, you know, just in the personal space. But how is it being on the same team? Me, I like this one. Well, okay. When I'm playing, <laughs> name spaces, I I don't really see. You know, I don't really see it. So I'm just going out there to play like I was very dominant, very strong, very explosive. And Sydney was my silent assassin, my shooter. So if I can get it, I'm passing her the rock so she could shoot it so she can attack. She's a like crazy good defender. So I feel like, you know, both of us playing different positions. Like I played mainly post and she was a guard. Like we had both sides of game so one thing that I can do but Sydney couldn't do like I would take care of and vice versa so I loved it yeah (laughs) I would say we complimented each other well um I'd also say like if I'm passing the ball to Nia in the game I know I'm not getting it back so like I was very careful (laughs) okay okay uh, okay, Ashton if that's true, let's ask them the time that resulted in a bucket, though. Okay, yeah. Okay. Definitely resulted we just trying to spit facts. Definitely resulted in buckets, but I just knew, like, okay, if I pass this, I'm not getting it back. But, yeah, if I, when I did pass it, obviously, she did what she had okay. to do. I returned the favor. You, you got did you? What? You got passes, too, for me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, for sure. Everybody knows, like, Nia's aggressive. Nia's, and it's, like... That's what I was going to ask next. I was going to ask who out of all three, you, 
Sydney, Nia, and Amir, who's the most competitive? 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 Mm. It depends <laughs> on what it is. I think we're all pretty competitive. Like, till this day, I still say I'm the best shooter in the family, and I have dad to back me up on that. But, you know. Well, okay. This is the thing. Like, <laughs> in what time? Because in college, you were the best shooter, but right now, I've done some work, so I'm, I'm like, a lot uh, uh, I still think I'm the best shooter, but, you know. It's, I think we're all pretty competitive. It's, okay. it's because if Amir's in the conversation too, Amir's saying he's the best shooter, so. Well, we, I mean, anyway. So it's all opinionated so, based on who you're talking to. But I'm gonna give you like actual good perspective. High school, college, Cine best shooter, Amir best overall player. I'm best, no wait, sorry. Amir best like, point guard, like passer, you know, okay. IQ reader, I'm best overall player. Okay. If we're talking stats, if we're talking stats, I average a double double. So yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, anyway. I mean, that's a that's a real conversation. I feel like a lot of people that have siblings and play basketball, especially professionally, I bet they have these conversations too, like the holiday brothers the ball brothers you know what i'm saying and i made a yep. comment earlier to my uh to the fam saying like low key you guys are like the ball brothers but two girls one boy like <laughs> like that's the dream but that's the dream like having all especially for your parents having all your kids play pro yeah work that they love like i've a lot of people want that to happen and you guys were able to make it happen so yeah, I don't know it's the dream though so I think we were definitely like very fortunate and blessed like our parents they had us like two years apart so they were like we were not paying for college they thought that we were hella athletic so they're like choose a sport my dad happened to know basketball so we stuck with it the goal was college right. to get education and then our love for the game grew and our ability was there and our potential was there so then we were able to pursue a professional career but by no means like I can't say for me that like it's been a dream it hasn't until recently so <laughs> no, that's I'm being honest for real. Oh, yeah. growing up like I was just gonna after college I was done and then I got to college and I was like now nah, I'll, I'll play after for a little bit but yeah definitely college was the goal for all of us to get our education paid for um, and I think our parents did an amazing job and it was definitely a struggle sometimes, um, but they got us there. <laughs> no, I mean, you guys are really being authentic. A lot of people kind of showcase, you know, oh yeah, it's great. I had an amazing journey because they have to say it, but along that journey, you know, a lot of athletes, especially including myself, you know, had some, you know, maybe I don't want to do this moments. Oh, hundred yeah. percent multiple times. <laughs> yeah. And I think that talking about it is a very much real situation and more athletes I think are gonna start feeling comfortable after, especially after hearing you two talk about it and you guys are sisters and feeling more comfortable on the podcast. Um just explaining your journey in the most efficient and you know authentic way possible. So that's very respectable. Was it difficult for you, Sid, leading the way and taking that first step as like the oldest going to play pro in Australia and Finland? Um, I wouldn't say it was difficult. I honestly didn't make the decision to decide to play pro until my senior year, like towards the middle of the season. Um, I was still pretty set starting off my senior year with being done after college. And then um, I don't know what, clicked or what happened but I knew that I wanted to um, keep playing afterwards and honestly I just wanted to travel and see different parts of the world and experience different cultures and basketball has taken me so many places um, in high school in college so I wanted to see where it could take me after college um, and I got to uh, play in Australia and Finland um, <clears throat> which was amazing so making the actual decision wasn't that difficult. It was just kind of a shock because my family also thought I would be done after, after college. So they were more shocked than, than anything, but I had an amazing experience and 
Um, it definitely wasn't easy. Like going pro is not what it's hyped up to be, especially if you're not going to the WNBA. Like, obviously, if you get drafted, you're going to have the top agents, you're going to have, you know, everything kind of set up for you when you're when you're going pro and it's not straight to the WNBA. It's a lot harder and it's a, it's just a different um, type of experience, especially finding a good agent and getting um, to the right teams and to the right countries. So in that aspect, it was definitely different for me than what it was for Nia because Nia got drafted number five, right. which was amazing um though so, so our experiences were completely completely different um but i still i still think it was an overall really great experience for me no for sure and going on to unia because uh cindy just mentioned kind of like the difference between going overseas playing pro and then going into the WNBA. how was it transitioning from northwestern and then getting drafted number five so transitioning to northwestern like in high school and in college, I was literally just kind of bigger, faster, stronger. So I was just able to use like my natural ability to kind of, so at the time it was a great, you know, way just to get going, to play, to be aggressive, to be me. But then at the same time, I didn't really realize I wasn't working on my game. I wasn't working on my skills. I wasn't working on my IQ because I could do majority of the things that I wanted to so even though I had success Western, when I got to the league, I was like in complete shock. Um, you know, when I got drafted, everyone was really high on me. I went number five, blah, 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 blah. Like I'm hearing good things like, oh, you'll be great. You'll be great. I played a post in college and the W, I am entirely too small. I know I'm big, but I am entirely too small to yeah. be playing the post, to bang it down there. Like I can't, I can't bang with Sylvia Fouts, like, let's be honest. So getting to the W, I realized how unskilled I was, how terrible my IQ was. And it just, it doesn't matter if you're, if you, how big or how fast or strong you are, these women are gonna outthink you. They're gonna, they're gonna take advantage of, of you as a rookie. So it was a terrible transition. <laughs> Literally, I felt like, uh. Oh my God. It was a shock. It was really a shock. Yeah. So after um, my rookie year, I really realized, I was like, look, if I'm going to be in this league, I have to get better. And I was told I have to be a guard. Playing a post transition to the guard, I feel like it's one of the hardest things to do. That's tough. Post, That's like it's different because you already have those skills. So I go to Israel and I'm trying to do my thing, trying to make money, trying to work on my skills, but you're playing your round. So how much time do you really have to develop the game? So it was a, it was a hard transition. I'm still going through it, but I am so much better than what I was three years ago. But when everyone thinks about like top draft picks and you know, their transition to league, they think it's smooth and sailing, not for everyone. It's right. really, not. it depends on like your experience and your skill level, your IQ and like your readiness and your mentality. 90% of it, I think is your mental health. It really is. But a lot of people don't know it until you kind of get there and it's been tough, but so I've been very fortunate and blessed that like every year, every season I'm getting better. I'm surrounded by the right people. I'm getting developed. I've, I've been blessed with having that time to develop in the league because not everyone gets that opportunity. Um, and then even with Sydney, like with her journey, another thing that I feel like is so important to point out is like, there are so many American guards. So when other countries are looking at, players you can only have one or two or three americans on a team right. you have american guards in the WNBA. you have girls who got to train camp got cut you have top players in college that didn't make it so there's so many girls that are flooding the overseas market and you're a guard it's that much harder so i feel like cindy i commend you because your positioning has been so difficult it's not that you don't have the ability or the capability it's literally the number of opportunities, the number of slots, the name of your school, your name. It's, it goes, it's, it's like so many complex things go into everything, but you know, every journey is just so different, but I feel like there, you have to appreciate it because, you know, there's every, there's a reason for every season you're in. Right. Sid, how did you manage that? Like, 
the oversaturation within your position overseas? Like, how did you like mentally get through all of it? Yeah, that was really tough. Um, like Nia said, there's so many more guards than there are posts. So posts are usually um, more looked after than guards because it's easy to find a guard, but it's real. It's hard to find a really good post. Um, so honestly, that just came down to a mental game of staying strong and positive because you're working out and you're busting your ass every day, not knowing if you're going to get picked up or not. And that is a tough feeling, Mm -hmm. um, especially when you're seeing other people getting signed, um, to overseas teams and you're like, it's, it's just, it's humbling and it just, it teaches you mental toughness. Um, and I'm one of the lucky people who did end up getting picked up, but that wasn't the case for everybody. And like Nia said, there's so many talented women, um, but the market is just so oversaturated for guards specifically. So you can be a really good player and not get picked up. And it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with your ability. It's just like Nia said, the teams, um, who your agent is, like it, it takes a lot of things to fall in place so right so that you can get where you're trying to go and what if one thing falls out of place like everything's messed up so that's the tough thing um like i said if you don't get drafted into the WNBA, um but with that just like i said be mentally strong and and keep working out even though you don't know if you're gonna get get picked up or not um and luckily i did no for sure i also an important part of that is like for the players who really have to start from the bottom and build their name their reputation like they have to consider taking not so great contracts where they're only getting paid like five hundred dollars a month or even if they sign a contract they're not getting paid on time but they have to play to build up their reputation like just because someone gets signed doesn't really mean that you know they're getting what they signed for you know so and you never know really what you're walking into when you're going overseas because like you don't see the places where you're going to stay you don't really get to see like the city or the people or yeah. so yeah. many, like, it's a big question where you but you better be praying that like god's it is yeah <laughs> you don't know you really don't know and i know some players that literally they played for nothing it took them six seven eight plus years to get anywhere but i'm like do you love the game that much? Do you have that much patience? Is it smart for you to take that route? Or is the Lord pushing you somewhere else so you can start your journey somewhere else? Like just those decisions you have to make and it's not easy. Yeah, lots of praying for sure. Oh, for sure. We know. <laughs> I mean, like how I said, like my brother, he played overseas, you know. Right. You, guys, you guys met up in Finland. Yeah, we were in Finland together. Yeah, so I think that's, you know, we hear stories about the the positives and then the negatives so I kind of have a little bit of an idea of how it is to be overseas though I haven't been overseas physically that mental grind I I can't even imagine yeah I can't imagine and do you think that your dad playing in the league helped prepare for any of this or is it just kind of like your own journey your own thing type of situation I think it's your own journey go ahead I think it's your own journey. First of all, so much players who played overseas when there was no technology, oh, yes. no FaceTime, no Netflix, no Wi-Fi. Oh, my. When people talk about like, you know, they're all bored or they're all whatever overseas, I'm like, y'all have some perspective. They didn't have Netflix. What, what were they doing? They didn't have Wi-Fi, FaceTime, like means any state hours on FaceTime all the time, but they didn't have that. But like, it's your own journey. My dad went through, like, he went through the grind of like getting picked up, getting cut, getting picked up, getting cut by different NBA teams, playing, finally finding a place on the Timberwolves, dislocating his knee, having to go overseas, having children like me and Cindy and I mean, we don't have kids. We're, we're sync, like, we don't have that, you know, that other re- responsibility of like providing for a family. So completely different completely different journeys mm-hmm. you have anything to touch on that Sid? you know nia pretty much covered it i mean obviously with him playing in the nba and just playing basketball overall that prepared us growing up but as far as our journeys definitely completely different yeah. and i wanted to talk to you Sid, too about 
your next step in life because a lot of people don't talk about life after basketball. Mm -hmm. And currently, because I just talked to you recently, you said that you're, you're finished. So how was it making that decision of, okay, I'm done? Yeah. Um, transitioning to people call it the real world is um, not easy for athletes. I mean, even athletes who played in college and they're transit and they don't go pro and they're transitioning um, into getting a job. It's really hard because it's hard going from a sport you've played your entire life um, and training for your entire life to just not training or in practicing or doing any of that anymore. It's like, it's been a part of you for so long. It's like, how do you transition um, from that to the real world? And nobody talks about that or tells you how to do it or how to go about it. And um, it can have a huge effect on your mental. Um, for me, it was definitely not an easy decision. Um, it was it was frustrating. It was sad. Um, I just went through a bunch of different emotions. Um, but you come to terms with it. And obviously, whatever sport you play, you know you can't play forever. Um, but that doesn't prepare you anymore for when it actually happens. So mm -hmm. honestly, taking it day by day and figuring out what else are you passionate about, I think that's really important for all athletes. Like, obviously yeah love your sport but like you need to have something else you're passionate about because it's going to end one day and even if that's like coaching for you if it's if it's really the sport that you want to do like forever like fine get into coaching but for people who don't want to continue on in that sport like you need to find another passion for me i specifically chose maris because they have fashion merchandising like i knew from a young age i wanted to work in fashion um so for me that was my other passion so I've worked in that industry for about a year now, um, and, and that's been good. I'm still figuring out what I want to do in the industry, um, but I, I will definitely say it was a difficult transition, and like I said, taking it day by day um, and just figuring out what I want to do um, has made it easier, but like no one tells you how to go about it, and you kind of just have to figure out on your own. And honestly, I think more athletes – who stop playing that talk about it, I think the better off it'll be for people who are going to start um, taking on that transition. Um, but yeah, I think that's just my biggest advice is taking it day by day. Well, I wish I freaking talked to you before I graduated <laughs> college. <laughs> no. It's so hard. It's so tough. But like, I feel like you found something though that you're passionate about and now like all that energy that you use for your sport you now can put into something else and honestly playing a sport is amazing because it teaches you so many things it teaches you how to work under pressure you have to know how to deal with wins and losses and you take that into whatever job you go to next which is an advantage over other people I think a lot of like how we mentioned before a lot of people don't talk about post athletic careers enough mm -hmm. And, um, and like how you said, it's gonna, it happens to everyone. So I think it should be more of a focus too, as much as being in career, for example, like with how you said, how you chose Maris because of the, the fashion aspect. And now you're able to use that um, now. And then right. you too, you know, like kind of dabbling into different things using your platform. And I think that's amazing because not, now you're not just thinking about you know, basketball 100%, which of course that's going to be naturally your thing, but you're also considering, you know, your interests and what may lead after you're done. So I think that's dope seeing it from both of you guys. And that kind of leads me to a question that's kind of outside of the basketball world because you guys are from Minnesota and everything that happened with George Floyd and the impact that has happened, um, that has been placed on the black community how has that affected you mentally, athletically, emotionally um, during this time? Obviously, after watching that video, it's it's hard to see and it makes you angry. Um, it makes you sad. Um, and then I, I felt like numb after a while and then I felt angry and sad. So it's just like a roller coaster of emotions. Um, and it's it's really sad to see how black people are being killed and just treated any kind of way. And usually in those cases, 
there's no justice served, which is what's really frustrating. And it's like, you feel hopeless because what can you do? And I know everybody handles these situations different, especially in showing their support. For me, I did go to a couple of the protests um, and that was an unreal experience, just seeing everybody kind of come together. Um, and and they, were, they started off as peaceful protests. Um, I was on the bridge when that semi truck came, which was really terrifying. Um, and then for the police to come and shoot rubber bullets and tear gas, peaceful protesters, it's just like, we have a, we have a long way to go. We have a really long way to go. Um, and people in Minnesota are still protesting. The media has stopped covering it and stopped showing it and stopped talking about it. Um, but people are still out there protesting every single day um, for justice and uh, protest against police brutality. But we have a long way to go and it's it's really mentally draining some days and um other days you feel strong but it's 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 just tough emotionally mentally it, it's really tough no for sure yeah i would say me and cindy had very different experiences with that um i feel like for me i it was hard to continue to train because we were still talking about having a season, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, thinking about those things and seeing what's happening in the world, it makes you lose motivation to like work out because it's meaningless. Like at the end of the day, basketball means nothing compared to, you know, what's happening in the world. And I'm more to myself, I'm a little bit more uh, introverted. So going, I would love to show my uh, support for, by going to protests, by doing different things um, out with other people in the public marching. But I had to do what was best for me and my anxiety would go through the roof. Like I couldn't be in those different situations and that made me feel guilty because of, because of the privilege that I have and because of how these terrible things are making me decision to, you know, to how, how am I gonna show my report? I mean, my support. So just, it was hard balancing, okay, what can I do that keeps me safe mentally, but still I'm helping other people. I'm helping my people, I'm helping my community. So that was a hard struggle. I was very numb for a long time. I was very confused for a long time. I didn't know what to do. Um, I spoke to a lot of different people that I see as my mentors, um, spoke to some of my pastors and they said, you know, it doesn't matter how, you, but if you're helping. So finding that for me, that was using, using my platform. Now I'm not that big on social media, but I feel like when you use it correctly, it can be great. So I started speaking out. I started doing different things. I started, thankfully, being a part of Phoenix Mercury. They've been so supportive. They've helped me to, you know, showcase some of the things that I've, I've written, helped me to be part of different nonprofits, helped me to, um, when, like, obviously the COVID situation is over, how to uh, put different events together so that, you know, I'm helping other communities register vote, learn what they're voting for, learn all the different types of elections that are important on the state and the local level and the federal and national level. So all these different things. So I feel like there's so many different ways to help. Um, and I feel like it's really important to, for people to understand that just because you're not helping in a certain way someone else is helping doesn't mean that, you know, what you're doing to help me any less. So um, that's what I learned, but that was incredibly hard to even go through on a personal level and feeling so guilty because, you know, you know, you feel like your problems aren't as important as what's going on in the world. So that was really difficult. Yeah. And I think that's, it's again, huge to say like people support in different ways. I know like just being in Minnesota and so knowing a bunch of people from Minnesota, some people shame other people like oh well you're not protesting so you don't support like there's so many ways you can support like like Nia said and finding your way to support is the important thing like if you're not doing anything then you're absolutely part of the problem if you're if protests aren't your thing don't go to protest find something else to do if using social media isn't your thing 
find something else to do, but make sure you're doing something um, because it's a, it's a huge issue and there's so many different ways um, that you can be helping. No, that's facts. I, I was talking to uh, Christina Nigue. Uh, she plays for the LA Sparks. Uh, I was talking to her like last week about this and she was literally saying like word for word kind of what you guys were talking about. If you can't figure out, like if one way doesn't work for you, figure out another way. Don't just be like, okay, this doesn't work and just let it go and forget about it. Just continue to figure out what's best for you and how you can impact the people that are surrounding you because now they're impacting the people surrounding them. And then it, it kind of grows into like this big bubble and of awareness. And you know, that's kind of, that's where change starts. It starts within your inner circle. Right. So I really commend you guys for talking about the different ways, um, kind of like Sydney, how you were saying, how you're more, um, you're more on the front lines. You're ready, you're ready for it. Like you, yeah. you don't mind that. And then Nia, you're more so of an introvert and then you have that guilt. But with that being said, you didn't let that guilt take over. You still try to figure out the best way for yourself. And I think that's what people need to hear. And especially our generation, you know, we kind of get a little complacent sometimes. So I think just having that constant word of, okay, let me keep going. Let's not have this forgotten is very vital and important. Yeah. So I really you guys for, of course, saying that. Is there anything else that you guys kind of want to say to anyone that's listening? Yeah, I would say that I love how more athletes and just in general, more people are taking um, a better look and at the importance of mental health. Um, I think people, even if you, you know, if you're feeling fine or whatever, I feel like people should, um, they should just look at, at inside themselves, you know, be open to um, going to a therapist, being open to see a sports psych, anything. But I just feel like it's, it's a part of our lives that because we can't see, we don't really take care of as much. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to our bodies because that's the physical we can see, we can see results. Um, but I, I feel like over the years from college to now, the importance that my mental health has taken a role in my life. Um, if I didn't see different sports likes or if I wasn't you know, involved with different like therapists or different programs, like I don't know if I would be in the, in the part of the journey that I am now. So I really think my open being able to, you know, seek help in those aspects and then to never, ever, never compare your journey to other people's because sometimes we're just not going in the same place. So of course our journey's going to look different and just to appreciate the season that you're in. Well, that's true. Everything, everything Nia said. <laughs> um, definitely though, like the last part about not comparing your journey. Uh, and that's for every athlete in every sport at any level, high school, college, pro, everybody's journey is different. Um, everybody has different goals. And, and it's so easy to wrap yourself up into what's happening to everybody else instead of focusing on yourself. Um, and focusing on your journey. Um, Cause usually what you're seeing is posted on social media and like you're seeing the best of everybody's lives. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So just make sure you stay focused on your journey and, and stay positive and just keep your head up. I think that's a fantastic way to end. I think that's amazing. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, these are my cousins. I wasn't gonna say it at first. <laughs> But I'm so happy to have family that is willing to talk about the important issues that are going in, that are going on within the athletic community, the Black community. Um, being a woman, you know, it's, it's intersectionality at its finest. And I'm so blessed to have you guys be able to talk and share your stories. Um, so I want to thank you guys again for being on the podcast. And I will for sure have you guys on in the future. Thanks for having us. Fun. Of course, we're gonna do this again. They're gonna see this again. Yeah, I'm I'm down for that. <laughs> <laughs>